On the morning of March 19, 1919, the stage was set for a clash of white and red forces near the German colony of Worms, nowadays Vinorodny in the Berezivka district of Odessa. The interventionist troops unleashed a ferocious artillery barrage among the advancing 15th Regiment and elements of the 2nd Ukrainian Soviet Army. Amidst the thundering fire, tanks of the 303rd Assault Gun Regiment emerged, threatening to blunt the communist attack. Sensing the danger, Soviet command swiftly devised a plan to outmaneuver the opposing forces and turn the tide of battle once more. Initially, a breakthrough was achieved near the Berezivka station, followed by a daring assault from the Red Sailors of the 15th Regiment on the White Artillery Battery, causing the gunners to scatter. With the loss of artillery support, the demoralized infantry supporting the tanks began retreating without orders, causing a rout. Amidst the chaos, soldiers of the 15th Regiment leapt upon the now unsupported tanks and the battle was won. Among the acquired spoils of war, four Renault FT-17 tanks stood out. There was an immediate temptation to turn these captured weapons against their former owners. However, operating such weaponry demanded proper training and expertise, which surpassed the immediate capabilities of surrounding soldiers. Thus, three of the tanks were dispatched to Kharkov to be consolidated into the ambitiously named Special Purpose Armored Division. Meanwhile, one tank was sent to Moscow as a gift to be presented to Lenin himself. Lenin took a liking to this French novelty and commanded its inclusion in the upcoming May Day Parade. However, the tank arrived in an incomplete state, rendering it incapable of moving under its own power. In response, another tank was swiftly dispatched from Kharkov to serve as a replacement. As the tank paraded through the streets, few could have assumed the real importance of the captured machine which would go on to become the foundation of the illustrious Soviet tank building school, shaping the future of armored warfare for decades to come. Shortly before the February Revolution, the Tsarist Russian government, seeking a way to turn the tide on the Eastern Front, initiated negotiations with France and Great Britain to acquire tanks. Nevertheless, none of the deliveries took place before the revolutionaries seized control of the state. Following the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks assumed power in Russia, and an uneasy peace established with the Central Powers quickly gave way to a new civil war. In response, the opposing White Army received substantial political, material, and at times direct military support from the Entente including the provision of the latest weapons and military vehicles remaining from the First World War, among them tanks. The British sent their Mark V and Whippet tanks, but their shortcomings in speed and range became all too obvious in the vast Russian steppe, where the front lines were sporadic and maneuver warfare the norm. The French also sent in their FT tanks, with the first 20 of which arriving in Odessa on December 12, 1918, in support of General Denikin's White Army. These turned out to be better suited to the realties of warfare in the Russian theater, primarily due to their compact size and relatively lightweight. They could be loaded onto lorries and quickly driven to operational theaters, where they would be unloaded and sent into action. As such, it came as no surprise that this was the tank that the Soviet government decided to reverse engineer and put into production for the Red Army. The two remaining Renault tanks were deployed as part of the Special Purpose Armor Division in the regions of Yekaterinoslav and Kremenchuk. Somewhat ironically, they fought against the forces of the same general who initially captured them, but who now stood in opposition to the Soviet regime. Both tanks were lost near Novomoskovsk on June 26, 1919, in a battle eerily similar to the one that led to their capture in the first place. The parade tank was also sent back to the front as part of the Sverdlov Armor Detachment of the 8th Army, before also being recaptured by the Whites. Despite these tactical failures, Red Army commanders eager to do away with the old Tsarist ways still saw tanks as weapons of the future, prompting the Soviet government to initiate a domestic tank production program. 
On August 10, 1919, a joint resolution by the Council of People's Commissars and Council of Wartime Manufacturing designated the Krasnoy Sarmovo plant in Nizhny Novgorod as the specialized tank producing establishment entrusted with the task of coordinating the production of an FT tank clone. Even though all the challenges stemming from the underdeveloped industry in Imperial Russia were not only carried over, but also greatly magnified, optimism was high, and the task was received with great enthusiasm. On the 22nd of August, the board of the plant agreed on the schedule that would allow them to produce their first worker-peasant tank in nine months. The relatively small weight and simple design of the hull and turret allowed other factories to involve themselves with the tank production. The workload was split with Moscow Automotive Enterprise, which was tasked with production of the engine and suspensions, Isora plant handling the production of armored plates, Petrograd Prudolov and Obukov plants tasked with arming the tank, while Krasnoy Sarmovo was in charge of the final assembly. On October 3, 1919, the Council of the Military Industry instructed the Isora plant to also undertake the production of 30 copies of the FT tank model. The plant began making the preparations for local tank production. However, they were disrupted by the FT tanks of General Yudenichi's White Army, which was at the time storming Petrograd. While reinforcements saved the city, it was decided that it would be impractical to burden a factory located on the front line with tank production. Consequently, the focus was shifted entirely to the Krasnoy Sarmovo plant, which would now bear the sole responsibility of tank manufacturing. On September 29, 1919, the remaining immobile tank, probably the same one originally gifted to Lenin, was dismantled and transported via railcar to be thoroughly examined by a special engineering team from the aforementioned factories, as well as two French ex renault employees who volunteered their services to the new Soviet government. The team was tasked with creating technical documentation of all components. Upon the creation of each blueprint, a full-scale metal model part would be immediately constructed and fitted into the reference tank to make sure everything fits. Many parts, including the entire engine, gearbox and transmissions were missing and had to be replaced with domestic components, sometimes designed from scratch. The initial replacement gearbox produced at the Krasnoy Sarmovo workshops proved to be problematic, leading to frequent gear jamming and breakage. In response, an engineer successfully devised an improved four-speed gearbox that was claimed to be less noisy than even the original French design. It featured lateral dry clutch friction discs and band brakes. Steering of the tank was achieved by a combination of braking and disengaging the lateral clutches. A high-speed gearbox was also designed and trialed but abandoned due to poor results. The suspension system resembled that of the French Renault utilizing leaf springs for the road wheels and a vertical spring to support the return roller and maintain track tension. The configuration of the road wheel assembly consisted of three bogies, each with two wheels, and one bogie with three wheels. The return roller mount was equipped with six wheels. The track itself comprised 32 linked sections per side. Despite the fact that the tank arrived without an engine, the AMO factory in Moscow was already producing Fiat 15 tear trucks, and their four-stroke, four-cylinder water-cooled 34 HP petrol engines proved to be a suitable replacement, giving the Russian Renault's top speed of 7.5 km an hour and a range of 60 km. However, a slight complication arose. The engine was larger than the one utilized in the original French tank design. To accommodate the larger engine, the rear portion of the new tank was widened, which distinguishes it from the original FT. Unsurprisingly, the tank inherited the layout of its predecessor, including a two-man crew, octagonal rotating turret in the middle, and engine compartment in the rear. Its boxy hull was to be assembled from rolled armor plates supplied by its aura, which would subsequently be riveted onto a frame. Sources do not universally agree on the armor thickness of these plates, which appears to have been between 16 and 18 mm all around, with the roof plates being 8 mm thick and underside 6.5. Turret is sometimes listed as being up to 22 mm thick. Combat mass of the vehicle was 7 tons. Various vision slits and non-revolving observation cupola on top of the turret were copied straight from the FT, provided visibility to the crew, 
which was generally described as pretty good and with little blind spots. As per the initial plan, the Russian Renault tanks were intended to be manufactured in two variants, cannon and machine gun versions, mirroring the armament composition of the original tanks. In British fashion, these were referred to as male and female tanks, respectively. To address the Red Army's desire for versatility, this plan was dropped soon after production began. Thus, the majority of Russian Renaults were fitted with Hotchkiss machine guns on the right side of the turret. These machine guns were all salvaged from captured British Mark V tanks, and while there was no specific regulation regarding the number of machine gun ammunition belts carried, it was common to have at least 10 of them. While perhaps a great idea on paper, the addition of a machine gun into the already crammed turret further diminished the limited space for gunner commander. To operate the machine gun effectively, breach of the 37mm gun had to be pushed up to create room, whereas operating the cannon often necessitated the complete removal of the machine gun from its position. The first tank would be produced with the only available original 37mm Puto SA-18 short-barreled gun. The rest would mostly be armed with 37mm Hotchkiss naval guns modified by the Putilo factory. These had originally been procured for the Russian Navy, but had been deemed inadequate and subsequently placed in storage. To enhance the gunner's comfort and stability, a shoulder rest was provided. The ammunition for the 37mm guns exclusively consisted of fragmentation shells with a theoretical maximum range of 2,000 meters, although the effective range was no more than 400 meters. The muzzle velocity of the shells reached 442 meters per second, and the gun could reach an effective rate of fire of 10 to 12 rounds per minute. The design and production of tanks were overseen by the Central Armored Directorate of the Main Military Engineering Directorate, their representative in the field being Commissar Ivan Krasyanovich Gogol, well known among the factory workers for his ability to solve any problem with vulgar language and a Mauser handgun. As such, the plant board put him to good use, having him conduct negotiations with subcontractors whom he'd promptly lock up as saboteurs until they agreed to the desired terms of the plant. Because of or despite Gaugel, the first stage of production was completed within months, and the production of the Russian Renault tanks was ready to begin in December. The initial stages of tank assembly were plagued by numerous challenges including a shortage of skilled workers, raw materials, and most importantly, food. The quality of armored plates provided by the Itzora plant was subpar, further hampering the progress. Consequently, the desired pace of work could not be attained, leading to multiple delays and a lot of pistol swinging from Commissar Gogol. It was not until May that production commenced in earnest, with the first of the tanks rolling off the production line in August 1920. Upon the completion of the first tank, workers at the Sermovo plant went on to discuss what name it should be given. Various suggestions were put forward, including Fighter, Comrade Lenin, and For Freedom. Eventually, it was unanimously agreed to combine all three names into one, and so the workers applied Freedom Fighter Comrade Lenin inscription on both sides of the tank. Additionally, a star and the inscription, or SFSR, were painted on the front of the hull. Every other tank was also given a name within the context of revolutionary themes immediately upon completion. The naming of the tank series as a whole remains a subject of disagreement among sources. In Fatyanov's book, Tank Renault Russian, published in 1927, which served as an operational and maintenance manual, the tank is simply designated as Russian Renault. Some sources mention designations such as the KS tank, derived from Krasnyo Sermovo, and the M tank, short for small. On August 31st, 1920, field trials began, with metal worker I.A. Averin assigned as the driver, accompanied by Commissar Gaugel in the turret, the tank embarked on its test run. The tank displayed remarkable maneuverability as it tackled challenging terrain, including a steep sandy hill. A practical structural strength assessment was conducted by demolishing a building. The tank successfully passed it after toppling a section of the wall. On November 12th, a commission from the Council of Military Industry arrived at Sermovo, commencing a second series of mobility trials during which the tank once again proved its capabilities. Trials persisted until the 20th, culminating in the disassembly of the tank to assess the wear and tear on its components. 
to elongate its profile while overcoming obstacles such as trenches and craters, a removable tail was installed at the rear. With the tail attached, the tank could surmount a trench up to 1.8 meters wide and an escarp of up to 0.6 meters high. Moreover, the tank demonstrated fair stability by not toppling over to its side when tilted at angles of up to 28 degrees. The tank exhibited a water wading depth of 0.5 meters, allowing it to traverse shallow forwards with ease. Furthermore, the tank boasted an impressive turning radius which equaled the width of its tracks, 1.41 meters. After the test, a list of 22 necessary modifications was compiled based on the results. The factory committed to incorporating these changes into the tank's design within a time frame of 1.5 to 2 weeks. Among the proposed modifications was the installation of additional hatches for engine access and above fuel tanks although not all tanks were updated and their presence varied. The initial tank of the pilot series was delivered on December 15, 1920. Following this, the Sermova plant maintained a production rate of four tanks per month until the completion of the production cycle in March 1921, after which no new orders for Russian Renaults were placed. According to factory records, the production of the 16th souvenir tank for Lenin also took place in the spring of 1921. This tank probably refers to the overhauled FT tank gift that Lenin initially received. Due to shortages, tanks number 1, number 2, and possibly number 3 and number 15 were devoid of a side machine gun. Additionally, tanks number 11, number 12, and number 13 were produced without any armament at all but were probably rearmed during an overhaul at a later date. The commencement of serial production of the Russian Renault occurred concurrently with the gradual conclusion of the Civil War. By the end of 1921, all Russian Renault tanks had been officially accepted and incorporated into the Red Army. They were organized into armored detachments, with each consisting of five tanks. These tanks would go on to peacefully serve on the Red Square Parade grounds and for plowing agricultural fields as improvised tractors. Years later, they would undergo an extensive refurbishment, with parts cannibalized from other FT tanks until they were all finally decommissioned in 1930. After their decommissioning, the Russian Renault tanks were distributed to tank schools and civilian universities for educational purposes. However, over time, all of the tanks were gradually dismantled and scrapped, with the last two FT-type tanks officially struck from records in 1938. By April 1, 1941, only an incomplete hull remained as the sole surviving relic of the entire batch. Remarkably, this hull survived the war and became one of the oldest exhibits in the Kubinka Museum alongside a Mark V tank. In 1970, the hull was refurbished by NIIBT Polygon and placed on display at the Central Museum of Armored Vehicles and Equipment. While the vehicle is equipped with a non-original turret featuring a dummy cannon and running gear from a Renault FT tank, its distinctively wider aft section betrays its Krasnoy Sarmovo origin. A full-size replica of the first tank, Freedom Fighter Comrade Lenin, was created by Krasnoy Sarmovo in 1980. This model, along with a T-3485, manufactured at the plant in March 1945, which participated in the storming of Berlin, became part of the memorial complex located in Glory Square, near the north gate of the Krasnoy Sarmovo plant. The monument was unveiled on May 9, 1980, in commemoration of the 35th anniversary of the victory in the Great Patriotic War. In conclusion, while the Russian Renault tanks never saw combat, their true value extended far beyond their physical presence on parade grounds and potato fields. Instead, it lies in their contribution made to the overall development of the Soviet Union tanks industry and military capabilities. Their design and production provided Soviet engineers with hands-on experience in designing and constructing tanks. The factories that manufactured these tanks gained valuable experience in tank production, owning their skills and capabilities in the process. The practical experience gained through training and maneuvers with the Russian Renault tanks helped shape the Soviet military's understanding of tank warfare and influenced the development of Soviet armored warfare tactics.
The practical experience gained through training and maneuvers with the Russian Renault tanks helped shape the Soviet military's understanding of tank warfare and influenced the development of Soviet armored warfare tactics. And what do you think of this Russian copycat? Would you want to plow potato fields by its side? Is there a tank you would like us to cover in a future narrated article? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and if it's within your means, support us on Patreon or PayPal. All money goes directly into making more content for you. Massive thanks to channel supporters, without whom these narrated articles wouldn't be possible. And see you next time.